Well, a very warm welcome to Knightswood Baptist Church. It's wonderful that you could join us today. And I pray that today you know God's love and you know God's grace in your life and that you'll be encouraged. And we're thinking today about encouragement, being encouraged in our life and our faith and our walk with God and also being an encourager to others and encouraging others in their life and in their faith as well. And there's no greater encouragement we have than, than knowing that God is with us right where we are just now. That his presence is with us and he wants to speak to us and minister to us and be here with us. God longs to be with us. He loves for us to be in his company and in his presence. And he's with us right here and now. There's a psalm which speaks of God's love towards us, Psalm 136. And it has a refrain that repeats over and over again, his love endures forever along the lines of his love has no end. His love has no limits. It says, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To him who alone does great wonders, his love endures forever. Who by his understanding made the heavens, his love endures forever. Who spread out the earth upon the waters, his love endures forever. Who made the great light, his love endures forever. The sun to govern the day, his love endures forever. And the moon and the stars to govern the night, his love endures forever. And then the psalmist talks of the great liberation that took place from Egypt, the freedom of God's people and how he led them through the desert and through the wilderness to a new place. And although that is also part of our story, we see the great fulfillment of the meaning of that in Jesus and what he has done for us, the freedom that we know in Christ, having been led out of a place that we were in, now into his light, into a new place. And grace being shown even to us. And so to the one who remembered us in our lowest state, his love endures forever and freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. And who gives food to every creature? His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. And so as we think of God's unending great love for us, let's bow our heads together in prayer this morning. Oh, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that your love endures forever. Your love knows no limits. Your love is without end. You're a God of generous love. In your sovereignty, in your majesty, you could have chosen to be any God who you wish to be. And you chose to be a God of love. Indeed, your word tells us that God is love. And your love has no end. It goes on forever in time. It has no limit as to the amount of grace that is poured out into our life. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your great love in our life. We thank you for the love shown to us through Jesus, who lived the perfect life of love and who loved us to the last, to the fullest, to the greatest extent, even dying for us and being risen again to give us freedom and liberation and healing and hope. And we thank you for the love shown to us by the Holy Spirit, whose very first fruit in our life is love. And who in our heart lets us know that we have been adopted as your children because of your love and your love in Jesus. Father, Son and Holy Spirit, we give you praise today. And we say as your people, give thanks to the Lord 
for he is good. His love endures forever. Amen. So if you're able to stand and we will sing a song.
Thank you. Well, it's great to be able to start up uh, things again. And this evening, uh, Ruth and Dave are going to be commencing uh, the youth group with kids uh, uh, at, at secondary school age. So Ruth is going to come. Ruth, thank you. And just tell us a little bit about that just now. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, so um, a couple of weeks ago when we were away on our, our day out, it was just so nice to see everybody again, catch up with all young people. Um, I actually uh, felt as if we'd never been away when we all got together again. So we're really looking forward to tonight. Um, hopefully we'll get everybody back, uh, anyone in secondary school. And um, tonight we just want to catch up and sort of settle into youth group, group again. It's from half six till eight, and it'll be every Sunday night now, unless there's holidays or whatever. But next week, we're going to start up um, a course that's going to take us up to um, around Christmas time. And it's going to be called, it's called NUA, and um, NUA Origins. And it's a new, a new uh, series of films produced by um, SU Ireland. And they're really, really good wee films, just 15 minutes long. And... From them, there's um, some questions to talk basically about faith. And I think it'll be really good for us because we have a brilliant bunch of young people. They're amazing young people, but they got on really well together. And um, so I think just being together, watching the, the DVDs and the videos, and then talking together is going to be really helpful. Um, we've got a mixed age range, and I'm really hoping that the younger um, can learn from the older and the other, vice versa as well but just to be able to sit and chat together but have games some of the games are themed some of the games will just be ones that we want to do but we'll have good fun and we'll also hopefully grow together um, in faith and be able to sort of talk about our faith together as well and some of the videos have got wee bits of testimony so we'll learn about other people's faith as we go as well so please be praying for that um, I think it'll be a really really good time for our young people really important time for them as well having been apart for so long um, just to be able to be together. Yes, yeah, so thanks very much, Ruth. Yeah, we'll be praying for that. Uh, Jesus pointed to young people and said, look, you need to be like these young people if you want to know what it's like to be part of the kingdom and to enter into the kingdom. And the kingdom belongs to such as these. So you want to be praying for these young people that they will come to know Jesus as their own Lord and Saviour and live for him as disciples uh, of the Lord. Um, we also want to grow in discipleship, of course, as well. Um, so Jack is going to come and talk to us just now about uh, studies uh, that he's got planned for us in midweek groups. So thank you very much, Jack. Hand over to you. Thanks, Gus. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, you are still there, that's good. <laughs> the theme that we're going to be looking at in October is getting to grips with worldliness. Now, if you've never been phased by how to behave as a Christian in a world full of complex values, nor ever felt yourself out in a limb trying to fit your faith in Christ into a world that increasingly rejects him, then this mini-series of studies is probably not for you. 
If, however, like myself, you've frequently been perplexed as to how you can be faithful to Jesus as a believer and steer your way through the moral maze of do's and don'ts in this increasingly judgmental society, then perhaps you will have some insights to share with people like me who need all the help we can get. So the four studies will begin in October, starting the first week in October and Wednesdays. They will consist of looking at worldliness as described by John in his gospel and also Paul and his take on it, but taking the lead from the, the saviour Jesus himself. How can we be in the world but not of it? Join me on the four Wednesdays in October, half past seven here for an hour as we reflect, study and pray through this topic. Thank you, guys. Uh, wonderful, Jack. Thanks so much. Um, sounds so good. So we'll be looking forward to that in October. Um, Laura is going to come to us just now and read from the book of Acts. So, uh, Laura, uh, why don't you come up just now? Thank you very much. So this is from Acts chapter 12, beginning at verse 25 and going on to Acts 13 up to verse 13. When Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who'd been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart from me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. The two of them, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God to the Jewish synagogues. John was with them as their helper. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you, you're going to be blind for a time, not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. From Paphos, Paul and his companions saved to Perga and Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. That's wonderful. Thanks so much, Laura. Well, it's Lynn Scott's last Sunday with us before Lynn moves house. And we thought it'd be great to have Lynn up the front just to express our thanks to her and to pray for her. And I'll be inviting uh, the deacons if they can come up and Ruth as well. And we'll gather around Ellen in order to pray for her. But first of all, Ruth's going to come up, uh, Lynn's going to come up just now, sorry. And <laughs> no, no, please, Lynn. <laughs> and uh, please come on up just now. And uh, you've got something you want to say to us all. Uh, so, so I'll hand over to you. Thank you very much. Morning. I've not got a sermon here, don't worry. It's big print, so it's not quite so long. <clears throat> yeah, just to share a couple of things. Um, for those of you who don't know my story, um, my husband John and I lived in South Africa for many years, and uh, we returned to the UK at the end of 1999. 
um, for medical reasons after he'd been hijacked, shot through the neck and left paralyzed. He subsequently died in 2014, but I didn't ever contemplate moving again, I have to say. Um, but that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. Uh, if I can just rewind a couple of years to July 2019, I stood, well, not here, but there. <laughs> um, and what I shared that day um, was some scriptures that I'd um, read and a, a podcast I'd listened to all within the space of a few days. Um, Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And another one was Romans 8, 26. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the third one uh, was Ecclesiastes 3.11. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Um, I often struggle to know what to pray for and sometimes even how to pray. Um, but Gus had mentioned a couple of Sundays prior to that Sunday in July um, that we often don't get because we don't ask. So I decided I'd ask. Um, I did feel a little bit that I'd survived uh, since John had died in 2014 and, and actually to a certain degree since we came back in 1999. Um, so my asking took the form of, Lord, what is your plan for my life? I want to live according to your will for my life. And I then read, um, that, and remember this is all in the space of about three days, um, I then read, there is a constant balance we must learn of resting in the knowledge that he will bring about all things to happen in his perfect time, but also wrestling with God for what he has said and promised. There are different seasons in life and sometimes we must let go of a dream and be prepared that it may never happen while holding on to the maker of our dreams rather than the dreams themselves. We have to be prepared to let the dream die so that it can bear fruit. The comfort in these times of letting go and allowing dreams to die is that nothing is wasted. What he is preparing you for is worth the wait. Time is a gift. It is in the waiting that we perfect the art of resting and listening. In the podcast that I listened to on my way to work, on the Wednesday morning, I think it was, um, Brian Houston, speaking about Isaiah 43, 18 and 19, speaks about the word behold. And he says it actually means wow. Stand in awe and be amazed. And wow, I'm overwhelmed at the goodness and faithfulness of God. I will do a new thing. I've done it before, but, and I will do it again. He went on to say that God has done so much for us in the past, but we shouldn't allow sentiment to erode significance. Significance is what's ahead of us, not what's behind us. Behold, stand in awe and be amazed. I'm going to do a new thing. The best is yet to come. And this was such a blessing for me at the time and such a confirmation that God was doing a new thing in my life and that his timing would be perfect for whatever that was, I could rest in the knowledge that I didn't need to know what the new thing was. Time would tell what it was. So coming back to 2021, I now know what this new thing is and I can literally say, wow, I do actually stand in awe and I am amazed. At the beginning of May this year, I found myself praying, Lord, if you want me to move, then you'll have to provide the means and opportunity for me to do that. Out of the blue, three days later, a family member phoned and offered me the money to purchase a property in my name, to live wherever I wanted to live. As I have friends and family in York and in Suffolk, it made sense to move to one of those places. And as property prices are actually better in Suffolk than they are in York, I decided that's where I would go. So I'm now the proud owner of a two bedroom bungalow about 15 minutes walk from the beach. So uh, slightly different to here. Uh, similar to South Africa, but there we were right next to the Indian Ocean. So that's, I don't think I'll be swimming where I'm going. But, um, but just to finish, um, the, the one verse that really sums this up is Ephesians 3.20. 
Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power, to him be glory. And, yeah. So that's great. Why don't members of the leadership come on up just now? We'll gather round Lynn. And uh, we'll pray. We'll pray for Lynn and pray for a blessing on her. So... Um, we've got a we've got a microphone, so whoever wishes to pray, please uh, please just lead away. Thank you, thank you. Let's pray. Let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Lynn. We thank you for all that you created her to be. We thank you for all that she is um, for us. Father, she's been such a big part of our church family and our fellowship. And we're so, so grateful for her. And um, as you have new plans for her, as she shared herself this morning, we just pray that you will go with her. You've already gone before her. You'll be behind her. You'll be beside her. Um, but go with her as she goes to Suffolk. And um, Father, we know that you will have... Um, amazing things for her to do there because we know who she is and we know that she'll not be able to help herself being involved uh, with uh, a new church family and, to, and, and serving and following and loving you and they're for others too. So Father we just thank you so much for her and we just pray your blessing on her. Amen. Yes Father I just pray for Lynn and, and pray for your peace to be upon her as she goes through this this transition phase lord may the peace your peace that, that surpasses all understanding just rest upon her and and just be with her as she uh, she moves from uh, from glasgow sunny glasgow to sunny suffolk <laughs> and uh, yeah lord we bless your name for and bless your heart for all that you have in store for lynn in this next chapter and as she goes lord will she uh, walk in uh, the shoes of the gospel of peace Lord, uh, that, that peace that she'll feel that transcends all understanding will translate itself into the new relationships that she finds herself in, the new conversations and the new neighbours and everything. Lord, that that would just overflow into all the, the people and, and situations that she'll find herself in. Yes, Lord, bless her, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, Amen. Oh, Father, we thank you that you are a faithful God, and Lynn is testament to that. Mm -hmm. um, just throughout all her life, um, despite the trials, um, and through the trials and the difficult times, that you have been with her and you have been faithful. And so we thank you for your faithfulness towards Lynn. We thank you that in this, this next chapter that is so obvious that you have been preparing a way for her, you have been going ahead of her, that you have been behind her. And Father, so we give thanks for this house, we give thanks for our family member, we give thanks for the community that she's going to be living in, Father. And we thank you for the, the church community that she's found to, Father. So we just want to bless you and give thanks for you as a faithful God. We want to give thanks for Lynn, um, for, the, for the difficulties and for the, the trials of life that she's been through, but for the joy um, that she's known to, Father. And we just thank you for the, the for her journey um, and we just pray that in this next stage that she would know your everlasting refuge um, and your your loving arms just being mm -hmm. around her and underneath her and comforting her and yeah father she, she goes from us but we want to send her with with our love um, we want to send her with with that deep peace that Alec mm -hmm. mentioned that that passes all circumstance that is not based on circumstance mm -hmm. and above all to go with a deep joy and a sense of knowing that she is right where she's supposed to be in the centre of your will, Father. So bless her, we pray in Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Yes, Psalm 139 says, O Lord, you've searched me and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O Lord. You hem me in, behind and before. You've laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. 
Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise in the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, and your right hand will hold me fast. Well, Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your guidance in Lynn's life, and that your right hand is holding her fast. You're watching over her, and you're preparing a way for her. We want to thank you for your faithfulness towards Lynn throughout all of these years. We want to thank you that in turn, Lynn has been so faithful to your people in the way she has served us and loved us here. We want to thank you for all of her service throughout these years. We also want to thank you for her friendship in the Lord. She really has been a great friend to so many, looking out for people, keeping in touch with folks, asking how they are, concerned for them. And we want to thank you for Lynn's place in our life as a leader, but also as a friend. And we also want to thank you that she is a great encourager and that she's an encouragement to us even just through the life that she has led. She's a reminder that there are some things in life you might not get over, but you can get through them with faith in God. And so we want to thank you for Lynn and for all that she has taught us throughout these years, lessons that will remain with us. So bless her, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we've got a gift here, Lynn, for you. It's a token of our appreciation. I did explain we thought of getting you flowers, but everything's packed up. You're ready to move. So uh, that is for you. We're going to sing together Faithful God because it's a, a song that sums up so much of what I felt when I thought of you and God's faithfulness towards you. Uh, So we're going to sing that together just now, but why don't we show our appreciation to Lynn uh, once again. Uh, Thank you so much.
We'll not need all of them. <laughs> We're thinking about encouragement today and what it is to be encouraged and what it is to be an encourager of others as well. And we all need some encouragement. We definitely need encouragement at the moment in life. However you've fared over these past 18 months, I think it's fair to say that we have all been touched by the troubles of a troubled world. And everybody needs some encouragement to some extent, to some degree, no matter how it has been for you, what you've been through um, in your own life, in your work, in your family situation, with your health, economically, who knows? But we all definitely need some encouragement. I was struck during the week uh, reading an article about church leaders and church ministers and, and a survey of what they'd been feeling lately. And I know everybody's been, been touched to, to some extent, but it was just interesting reading about how many are feeling uh, bewildered and confused about what is meant to be happening next, how they're meant to lead forward. Some are feeling tired and weary just because it's been so relentless for so long. Uh, a phrase I hadn't heard before, decision fatigue. Every single thing that they have had to do over these past 18 months has involved so many decisions, so many steps, that apparently they are just tired of making decisions. More decisions all the time, decision fatigue. Apparently, well, we all definitely need some encouragement uh, at the moment. However, we view what has taken place over this past while, these have not been good times. And so I thought today we would look at a character who appears uh, in Acts. We, we've met him a number of times and he's appeared in the passage that we had read today who is a great encourager and he's about to, to go from the, the pages of Acts. So be, before he goes, I thought we'd just keep a hold of him just that wee bit longer and look at him and see what we can learn from him about what it is to be encouraged and what it is to be an encourager of others. And it's Barnabas. Barnabas who appears at various points throughout Acts and is always, always encouraging others. Barnabas was a good man and good people encourage others and encouragers are good people. And when I say Barnabas is good, I don't mean he's good in the sense of being, you know, quite good, good, pretty good, great, kind of six out of ten. I mean good in terms of the quality and the integrity of him as a person, a goodness within him, being good a godliness that just dwells within him and just exudes from him whenever we encounter him. It's the kind of goodness that we thought about earlier in our service. Uh, uh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. When we think of the fruit of the Holy Spirit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Goodness is in there. It reminds us when Paul wrote in, in Romans that very rarely someone might die for a righteous man, but for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. It's the kind of goodness of a person that makes an impression upon us, even though that person in their goodness is not trying to impress anybody because of their goodness but it makes an impression upon us. And Barnabas was that type of person. In fact, when Luke uh, writes of him in Luke chapter, uh, sorry, in Acts chapter 11, uh, Luke writes this of him uh, in Antioch. We're told in 11.22, news of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts he was a good man, Luke writes there next. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great number of people uh, were brought uh, to the Lord. And we read about him again in Acts 12 and 13 there. And we see his goodness in so many ways. He just loved to encourage folks and bless folks. We, we read about him back in Acts chapter 4 when we find him for the first time in Acts 4, 36. 
Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. There was a, a prophetic exhorting side to him in the way he, he encouraged others. He sold a field, we're told, in the, that he owned and, and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. He had a generous heart. He wasn't mean-spirited. And that goodness flowed from him. He encouraged others with his giving. He encouraged others with his serving as well. We've just read here in Acts 13 at the church in Antioch. There were prophets and teachers, leaders there. Who's the first person named Barnabas? Barnabas there in that position. He's serving and he's giving of himself. And he just loved to see people grow and to flourish. It's good to be an encourager and we all need encouragement. You need encouragement from others, but others need encouragement from you. A phone call, a message, a note, a conversation, just helping them on this journey. Who are you encouraging? Who could you encourage? Who could you even encourage today? It's such a good thing to be an encourager and we see that here in Barnabas. And part of Barnabas' goodness and his encouraging was he just loved to see people grow and he loved to see people flourish as well in his encouragement of others. So at the church of Antioch, uh, we're told uh, that uh, Barnabas was sent there to Antioch, the Jerusalem church where Barnabas was, they sent Barnabas off to Antioch and when he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and he encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their heart. When he saw evidence of grace in their life, it made him glad because he just loved to see people grow and he loved to see people flourish. Were they all perfect in Antioch? Probably not. Was everything perfect in the church there? Probably not. But Barnabas, he saw them growing. He saw them flourishing. He saw evidence of grace in their life and that made him glad. And so he stayed with them and encouraged them all the more. We can also see that in how Barnabas dealt with Paul or Saul uh, as we first find Saul in the book of Acts. Saul is a conversion on the Damascus road and Saul is in Damascus. He has an amazing, amazing experience of the Lord and, and Saul has changed. And of course, we know that he had to leave uh, Damascus and he had to go to Jerusalem. And we read this in Acts chapter 9, verse 26. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, understandably given Saul's past, not believing that he really was a disciple and it wasn't unknown to have spies and such like in the church to inform on them still happens today but we're told Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles he told them how Saul in his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. Saul tries to join the disciples. They're not sure about him at all. But who steps in? Who wants to see Saul grow and flourish? Is Barnabas. But what all Barnabas stepped in and helped Saul. And at the church in Antioch, after Saul went back to his hometown of Tarsus, as, as Barnabas is, is with this church in Antioch and he's glad he's seeing evidence of God's grace in their life and they're growing, they're growing all the time. Uh, we're told a great number of people were brought to the Lord. So these people need to be taught, they need to be discipled, they need to be cared for. And we're told then Barnabas, he went to Tarsus back where he knew Saul was to look for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And so for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch while Barnabas was with Saul. And Barnabas there, he went in and got Saul. He remembered the calling on Saul's life and said, look what's happening here. And he had Saul alongside him. He says, teach with me, teach, me. teach with me. And, and Saul grows and Saul develops. 
Saul becomes a leader in the church. And so in Acts chapter 13, as we read, in the church in Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas comes first, and Simeon, and Lucius, and Manian, and at the end, Saul, last on the list. But there, and a leader now in that place, Saul to become Paul is growing and they were told that they go and as they go it's Barnabas and Saul. Note the order, Barnabas, the senior and Saul. But very soon Saul, he's growing and he's developing and Barnabas would just have loved to have seen Saul grow and flourish and very soon it's not Barnabas and Paul, it's Paul and Barnabas. I'm sure Barnabas' nose wouldn't have been out of joint at all about that because if you're an encourager and you want to see people grow and flourish, you're not childish about things like that, you're not churlish, you don't feel as if your toes are being trod on or anything like that, you want to see people grow, you want to see them come on and that's what Barnabas did with, with, with Saul who became Paul. But you know, Barnabas was such a great encourager that he also loved to see the evidence of God's grace in people's lives, even when they made mistakes. And people do make mistakes. But Barnabas was the type of person where even when that happened, he was full of faith, not in people who let us down, but full of faith in God and the grace of God that can do amazing things in folks' lives even when we get things wrong, even when we might think our past disqualifies us from service or from grace. Barnabas knew that it doesn't actually if you allow God to change you. And we see that in the life of someone else, just to close. Who does Barnabas decide to also take along with him? Well, we read, just, this is just a detail slipped in, that when, uh, when they returned from Jerusalem, they took with them John, also called Mark, we read that in 12.25. They returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. John, Mark. Oh, who's he? Well, actually, we know uh, from Colossians. Excuse me while I find it. Colossians 4.10. Paul writes, My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. So they were cousins, and Barnabas goes and fetches his cousin, who I'm imagining is his younger cousin. We come across John, also called Mark, a bit earlier. We read about this a few weeks ago. Remember when Peter was in prison and he miraculously escaped? And when he realised that actually it wasn't a dream, an angel really had let him out of the prison, and he suddenly finds that the angel's gone and he's standing in the street. And he says, what it dawns in him, he went to the house of Mary, this is in Jerusalem, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. A room, a Jerusalem church, is there. It's a centre for the Jerusalem church in this house. And John, also called Mark, is there. He would have known the great and the good, if you like, of the Jerusalem church. All kinds of folks, he would have seen it all unfold before his eyes. Barnabas obviously sees something in him and thinks, this is another disciple who can grow and flourish in the Lord. I'm going to bring him along with me. And so he goes and fetches him and he, he brings him along. And in fact, we, we, re, we just read about that, didn't we? That he takes him along. Barnabas and Saul are sent out by the church from Antioch. And we're told in chapter 13, verse 5, John was with them as their helper. He was there. Now he's growing. But interestingly, the last verse we read was from, pa from, from Paphos. Paul and his companions, Barnabas as you mentioned now, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga from, to, in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. John, also called Mark, turns back. Why? Well, it was dangerous territory. That region is known for, for bandits, especially up in the mountains. Was he frightened? Was he missing his mum back in that house? Had some of them fallen ill? Uh, was he only ever intending to go so far but hadn't told the others? Was he not liking the way his cousin Barnabas uh, was now, if you like, 
uh, going into the shadows of it, and Paul was, was taking more of the line. Like, did he not like that? Is this what triggers the council at Jerusalem and the mission to the Gentiles? It takes place with John, also called Mark, hot tailing it back to Jerusalem to let them know we don't know. Of course, we don't know why he turned back, but, but Paul certainly didn't seem to like it. In chapter 15, verse 36, we're told sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back. Let's go back and visit all those places, all those churches. Let's see how they're getting on. Let's, let's encourage them. We're told Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. That's how Paul certainly viewed it. He deserted us. He had such a sharp disagreement, we're told, that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. So Paul says, no, we're not taking him again. He, he deserted us, but Barnabas says, well, okay, if you're not going to take him, I'll take him. I still think he can change. I still think he can grow. Let's see what the Lord can do in his life. And so Barnabas takes John, also called Mark, and goes in a different direction. What happened next? Well, who knows what happened in the years to follow, but, but piecing together the evidence and, and looking uh, in God's word for what happened, uh, we, we find, for example, in, in 2 Timothy 4, uh, we read uh, there of, 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 of Paul mentioning Mark. And we also read of of, of him and Philemon as well. And, and, and Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. This is Paul, and now, now he's, he's a fellow worker there. Get Mark into Timothy 4 and bring him with you because he's helpful to me in my ministry. So Mark is now a fellow worker. He's been restored. He's come good. And now he's helpful to Paul. Paul it is able to say in that letter, Colossians 4, as we read earlier, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, you've received instructions about him. If he comes to you, welcome him. Welcome, Mark. This is my fellow worker. He's helpful to me. You just never know what can happen in folks' lives. Have you ever made mistakes? Have you ever got it wrong? Did God give up on you? Did God stop loving you? Of course not. Well, if God treats you that way, why would you treat anyone else another way when, when they make mistakes, when they say something or do something that isn't right? We believe in the grace of God that can transform. And Mark himself was changed to the extent that one day he sits down inspired by the Holy Spirit and writes the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Well, amen, and let's uh, hope that the Lord blesses those words to our heart. And Alex, you're going to lead us as we sing all of this amazing grace that we know in God as we close our service. Thank you, Alex. <coughs>
And so as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us all forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you.